Is it about that time? Yeah, I think it's about that time. Another year has come to a close as we say goodbye to 2015 and bring in the new year of 2016. And as such, it's time, because we are a podcast, to do our yearly best and worst of 2015, because we are just that much bottom of the barrel, and you guys want to hear our opinions of, of what, what we think were the best and the worst, because unlike you guys, we have a podcast, which means our opinions are automatically better than yours. Yeah! This is the Haymakers Best and Worst of 2015 special. Greetings, Low everybody. My heat. name is Cal. Low effort heat. <laughs> Low effort content. <laughs> low effort. Actually, no. This this won't be low effort. I think this is going to be a lot of effort, so. Oh, God. This actually, a lot went into this. Greetings, everybody. My name is Kalkos, and joining me is... Dune Critic. And Nikki. Hey, we finally did one of these freaking intros without us either stumbling <laughs> over each other or nobody saying a goddamn thing! <laughs> Aren't we great? Good. So yeah, uh, as I mentioned, this cast actually took a lot more work than usual, but uh, I think it'll be worth it because this I have a lot of really, really cool stuff planned, and I think all of you guys are really going to enjoy it, especially since this is sort of like, a, it's a summary for, for a year, an entire 365 days that have passed by us and entertained us with all of their wonderful flippy shits. So I think it's about uh, time... We just get right into it. Get this uh, get this going, starting off right. Uh, Actually, before we do, I want to say for those wondering, oh, yearly thing, you didn't do one last year. Well, uh, the reason behind that is because when we brought Calcos on and we started a new format, it seemed a little too early for us. And Los Calcos was kind of just getting back into wrestling. So now, from January of this year all the way up until now, we've had an entire year to focus on everything. So now it makes more sense to do a, a best and worst of this year sort of thing. Dude, that is so kayfabe, and I love it. <laughs> uh, way to keep it kayfabe. Toon, yeah. you get to start the first category, so take it away. Yay, I didn't even bring a suit for this. Fuck it. All right. With wrestlers today, it is important to have a gimmick as well as being able to wrestle. And we've seen a lot of really interesting gimmicks this year. So uh, what is important about that, just really quickly, is it has to stand out. It has to be memorable. It has to be funny and entertaining so let's start with the honorable mentions for best gimmick starting off with our truth wrestling photo bomber john cena united states championship open challenge apollo cruz world's happiest man curtis axel never eliminated the vaude villains 20s era carnival men mil muertes man of a thousand deaths and Pentagon Jr., Breaker of Bones. And the winner of Best Gimmick goes to... The New Day Motivational Heel Faction. It's a new day! Yes, it is! Boom. Boom. Okay, look, you guys knew coming into this category, there is no other thing that we could possibly put as the winner of Best Gimmick 2015. All right, the New Day went from chumps to champs in the span of about a month and a half from WrestleMania all the way to, um, what is it, Elimination Chamber or whatever? Mm -hmm. They, they, they was, went from chump to champ in no time. I think it was even quicker than that because I remember re-watching our Extreme Rules video at one point, and I believe that was when Cesaro and Kid were going up against the New Day, and at the time, uh, the New... The New Day were still, were only just starting to turn heel. Like, Xavier was just kind of dragging them into heel status, kicking and screaming almost. So, probably from just around before WrestleMania, or just around after WrestleMania, to, like, payback. In the span of less than a month and a half, they went from actually the worst thing in wrestling to actually the best thing in wrestling. <sighs> See, this, this is why... I hate to turn this into a, a rally against Vince thing, but like almost every star that you see in the WWE got that way when they broke away from the character that Vince made and they just went and became the person that they wanted to be in their minds. Like it happened with Steve Austin, happened with The Rock, happened with Cena, just too many people to count. Yeah, with the, with the New Day, what makes it uh, stand out from all this, I, I personally think that, like, you know, um, Cena and Vaude Villains had something really good going on for them. But what the New Day does is that they deliver content that feels 
fresh on every every time they come out. They're actually entertaining. They can get the crowd riled. I've seen it now to where you hear less New Day sucks chants and now New Day rocks chants. And they're doing it organically. They're not like being forced to like do stupid stuff. They're creating their own gimmicks within themselves. Like the whole the whole unicorn thing. You thought that was gonna be stupid, but no, it's a t-shirt. They have unicorn horns now that people are wearing in the stands. So out of all these, New Day has managed to get over by themselves. Xavier Woods has also started a very successful YouTube channel called Up, Up, Down, Down, completely out of kayfabe, but still sponsored by WWE with over 250,000 subscribers. And they are endlessly entertaining, especially since they can get wrestlers to get in on this. And yeah. I mentioned actually uh, about like nine months ago that there was a big generation gap within WWE where a lot of the old talent kind of misunderstand the new talent because they grew up with different interests and different hobbies. And you can see that because thanks to this YouTube channel, now you can see that almost all of the entire new roster, everyone from Big E to The Miz to Seth Rollins to Bray Wyatt, everybody plays a shit ton of video games. Oh, so, yeah. like, even Mark Henry. Like, even even fucking Mark Henry. They, they, like that was the one that surprised me the most because he, like, he walked in on, I think, Rollins and Woods playing Turtles in Time. And I was like, oh, yeah, I love that game. And I'm just like, dang, look at you, Mark Henry. I knew <laughs> I liked you for a reason. The New Day gimmick has done wonders for the career of Xavier Woods, Biggie, and Kofi Kingston and has endlessly entertained us for the last nine months. And as such, they win Best Gimmick of 2015. I'm up next. So... Let's talk about people who've gotten way better over this year. Like, at one point in this year, everybody that I'm about to list off could have been described as, I don't want to watch this person wrestle. But now, now these people are fun to watch every time they step into the ring. Here are your honorable mentions for most improved wrestler. Big E. Roman Reigns. Son of Havoc. Xavier Woods, Johnny Mundo, Dana Brooke, and your winner of Most Improved Wrestler is Baron Corbin. Oh my god. Like, this is the ultimate proof that NXT as a developmental territory works. Because earlier this year, back when Baron Corbin was feuding with Bull Dempsey, Baron Corbin was the worst thing about NXT, mm. bar none. He would come out, do one move, win, and be done in three minutes. From the time he walked out to the time he walked back, three minutes and done. It sucked for everyone involved. But now, now he's putting on not technical masterpieces, but perfect matches for the character that he's trying to portray. And... The gimmick or the, the little added wrinkle to his character, his anti indie wrestler thing is just the perfect, the perfect thing to add to his character and the perfect thing to get heat out of the NXT crowd. It is just they are doing wonderful stuff with Baron Corbin. And if he were to get the title at some point, I would not have a problem with it. Yeah. The thing about Baron Corbin is that when he started off as a squash wrestler, nobody really took him seriously in that regard. You see a lot of wrestlers, like big guys, start off as like squash matchers. You know, they they'd make like um they go through people like in 10 seconds or like a minute just to prove a point, and their matches become stale and repetitive because like, oh, okay. But it's just it's it's more of a temporary thing because then they can move on to actually compete with higher up wrestlers and he, you've seen him compete with like Paulo Cruz for instance uh I'm, I'm thinking Rhino yeah some people like that he's slowly gotten better and out of all these people he has improved because he shows more more energy in the ring he has shown a few more moves that he can do and he looks great honestly and on top of that he has gotten really good at banter like I'm not gonna say he's Kevin Owens level good at bantering in the ring but he's pretty damn good like he's always got something snarky to say to the to his opponent. If you've seen Takeover London, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And I refuse to spoil it because I already accidentally spoiled something from there for Calcos. <laughs> Fuck you, Nikki. <laughs> OK, so the big the biggest reason why we put Baron Corbin on this list is because 
when it comes to all three of us, he was the one wrestler in NXT that none of us wanted to see. We always thought he was a waste of time. But now, at the later part of 2015, all three of us are very eager to watch his matches and just see what he can do next. And I think that is the perfect embodiment of a wrestler that has improved in his craft. He's improved in his promos. He's improved in his wrestling skill. He's improved in gimmick. He has improved in everything all around. And that is why he is the most improved wrestler of 2015. So, the next category is going to be a very broad one, but I'm going to do my best to lay this out. In the year 2015, a lot of wrestling promotions have gotten much easier to access, and as such, it has been much easier for your average wrestling fan to get a hold of their content, whether it's Chikara, whether it's New Japan, whether it's WWE, whether it's anything. Now, instead of having to trade tapes or look online for torrents, they have subscription services and online deals that they can use to get their content out there. So, we have a lot of access when it comes to pro- uh, to wrestling federations, and as such, we can rightfully declare the best federation of 2015. Now, there are no nominees for this, uh, honorable mentions, I should say, for this category, because almost all of the promotions are honorable mentions. Everything from Ring of Honor to New Japan to Chikara to BWG to everything. Even TNA? No, not TNA. TNA (laughs) is the exception to that rule. So instead, I'm just going to name your winner of Best Federation 2015, which is Lucha Underground. Hell yeah. Surprise. Now, we're breaking the rules a little bit because technically Lucha Underground is not a promotion. It is a television show that promotes and showcases wrestling from Triple A, the Mexican, prom- uh, the major Mexican promotion. However, fuck that rule because I'm not interested in Triple A. I'm interested in Lucha Underground. The one thing that came out of Triple A this year that most people know about, other than Lucha Underground, is pretty much universally terrible. And I think we'll get to that in a little bit. But mm. Lucha Underground just represents everything great about professional wrestling just the silliness the athleticism the the downright just craziness of that is professional wrestling in a nutshell is lucha underground yeah when it comes to lucha underground uh it has a very different feel to it than most wrestling promotions if you look at the promos that they do or the the backstage stuff it's all kept in just one location so everything feels like localized everything feels more like at home when you see the arena they don't change it up so it's always interesting to see how they take advantage of that entire arena you've seen people jump off parts of it you've seen people slam through the roof you've seen all sorts of cool stuff in the temple and i what the one thing i love about lucha underground is that it feels like the wrestlers have more uh freedom to do things in the ring there's a lot more fast paced stuff that's probably due mostly to the editing and there's a lot more uh, there's a lot more to do in terms of like mic time. Yeah, but you know what? The editing stuff I'm totally fine with because it just makes these wrestlers look even more superhuman than they already are. Like by eliminating, like you almost never see these guys do rest holds yeah. or really take any kinds of breaks and that's edited out. But it just makes these people seem even more resilient and it- they, Superhuman. They're, yeah, they're, they're cutting down- on the times where you're just like, oh, okay, whatever, and and emphasizing the points where you go, holy shit, these people are literal superheroes. <laughs> Lucha Underground is also really innovative in that it takes the backstage promo style from things like WWE, and it just makes it its own telenovela style of acting and blocking and scripting and everything. It, honestly, I was watching an episode of Lucha Underground at at my parents' house, and my dad walked in, and he thought I was watching a wrestling film at yeah. some point. He thought I was <laughs> watching a fucking movie. No, it's a wrestling show with people that wrestle, and the focus is about wrestling. That is awesome. I think Lucha Underground is the best place to go if you're looking to get someone who who's vaguely into, into wrestling to make them into a real fan of wrestling. Lucha yes. Underground is very easy to act uh, to um, 
uh, not to access. As a matter of fact, access is one of its biggest problems, but it's very easy to get into. One episode, maybe two, and if you don't like it, there's no hope. But that's very unlikely because it presents itself in such a unique manner that is not only unique to it... But it also allows the casual fan who's interested in things like soap operas or television dramas to really connect with the characters very quickly and very easily. It wins Best Federation of 2015, bar none. And for those Mm. curious, Season 2 is coming up very soon with Rey Mysterio as one of the biggest stars for it. So if that's not motivation enough to check out Season 2, definitely do so. Also, Lucha Underground has made a Season 1 recap video, so if you want to check that out, it's it's not too hard to find, but definitely watch it if you're curious and you want to catch up and don't have the time to watch all the episodes. That's a great way to get you into it. Season 2 is going to be awesome. Man. What? Rey Mysterio. Well, no, spoiled. that's not he's a spoiler. Been, he's it's been in the at, trailer. He's all over the promotional material and in the trailer. Yeah, oh. it's not a spoiler. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Nikki, what's... Um, I'm sorry, Toon, what's the next category? Our next category is Best Pay-Per-View Slash Special Event. So, for this category, we're going to talk about all the pay-per-views that happened this year. We're going to narrow down which one we thought was the best. We're also including special events, which were some of the network specials. For those that, you know, didn't quite catch up on pay-per-views and only are focusing on pay-per-views. So, uh, before we get to that, we are going to have one of our old co-hosts, Gabe, give us his thoughts on what the best pay-per-view special event was this year for him. What's up, Paymakers? Gabriel here. They say you never forget your first love. And for once, I'm not talking about Seth Rollins. I'm talking, of course, about my pick for pay-per-view of the year, NXT TakeOver Brooklyn. Incredible matches across the card and through all three main divisions. This pay-per-view solidifies itself as one of the most exciting in recent memory thanks to an iconic co-main event between Sasha Banks and Bailey, and single-handedly made me a wrestling fan. And now let's get to the honorable mentions. Starting off with Wrestle Kingdom 9, New Japan Pro Wrestling, NXT TakeOver London, WWE, Ultima Lucha, Lucha Underground, SummerSlam, WWE, WrestleMania 31, WWE, Best in the World 2015, Ring of Honor, NXT TakeOver Brooklyn, WWE, and the winner of Best Pay-Per-View Slash Special Event of this year goes to WWE Beast in the East. Oh, uh-huh. Yeah, you probably weren't expecting this one to win it. The event that they had over in Japan with uh, focusing mostly, I guess, on uh, with the promotional material being Lesnar, uh, there was something a little different that happened there. I okay now this one was a very heavy contest between TakeOver Brooklyn and WWE Beast in the East but um I put this initially in the winner's slot and there was a little bit of contention from Nikki and Toon Critic and there's a few reasons why I picked Beast in the East one it really brought well I I'm sorry I um uh picked it and they decided to just go with it it's be- a big reason is because it brings back the nostalgia when it comes to the Attitude Era. It's gritty, it's dark, and it feels like I shouldn't be watching it. Um, two, it showcased some... It, all of the matches were very, very good. Even the Brock Lesnar squash match was very entertaining in its own way. Um, but the biggest reason, I think, is that it proves that the WWE product can be so much better than it currently is. Even if it's good, it can still be so much better, even though they don't have to change a single thing. And that is because of Michael Coles and Byron Saxton's commentary. They were commentating at 5 a.m. on a satellite feed in Connecticut, in Stamford, Connecticut at their headquarters. Vince and um, Kevin and everybody else was was gone. They were either sleeping or they were doing something else. This meant that nobody was micromanaging them. This meant that their commentary was fucking awesome. It proves that Michael Cole, Byron Saxton, and probably even JBL and Jerry Lawler are fantastic commentators when you just let them do their fucking job. That, to me, I think that is so important to why Beast in the East wins. It's because it is a testament to how good the WWE product, not NXT, the WWE product can be when it wants to be. 
Yeah, there was some really great matches that happened to it. You saw the likes of Jericho versus Neville, which is some consider a dream match. You saw Finn Balor beat Kevin Owens for the NXT Championship. All these matches, well, not all these matches, a lot of these matches were great. And I think that a small little event like this shows that we need more events like these. You know, we need more events where it feels like on a smaller scale and not huge that way there's more time to focus on the little stuff also we got streamers during the balor and owens match and that just made me cream my pants <laughs> oh dude streamers in a wwe ring oh, oh my god that made me so happy <laughs> yeah and, and on top of that there was the main event or not not the not the main event, because the main event was kind of shitty. It was Dolph Ziggler and John Cena versus Kane and Big King Barrett. That's like a dark match live event main event thingy. I mean, excluding this, this that match, weird. though. I mean, every pay-per-view has that dud match that you don't really enjoy that much. So, I mean, but, even even Brooklyn had Apollo Crews versus the other guy. All right, nobody cared about <laughs> that shit. It was Dillinger. But um, the Brock Lesnar-Kingston fight, that was brutal. It was it was brutal. And not only was it brutal for Kingston, it was brutal for all of the New Day. Like, oh, poor guys. I always get so scared whenever I do, when I see Brock Lesnar start doing Suplex City because I'm always worried that move could very easily break your neck if you land the wrong way. But no, right. Kofi just got murdered. Anyway. Be Beast in the East for best pay-per-view slash special event 2015. So we did some good stuff here, but we also talked about a lot of bad stuff here. Like... WWE, in fact, all wrestling promotions in general are not immune from the dud pay-per-view or special events every so often. But before we get into our honorable mentions, we have another one of our old co-hosts, James the Squirrel Theorist. James, what do you think was the worst pay-per-view of the year? I think the worst and clearly the worst pay-per-view of 2015 was the Royal Rumble from its lackluster matches to its terrible booking from the Ascension winning over the New Age Outlaws, which amounted to nothing, the Usos beating Damien Mizdale and The Miz, where The Miz and Damien Mizdale had monster heat and were over the moon, to the terrible, terrible booking of the Rumble having Roman Reigns win. I could go on at length for this but they're just some of the few problems it had. And here are our honorable mentions. WWE Fastlane, WWE King of the Ring, and WWE Survivor Series. And your winner of Worst Pay-Per-View slash Special Event of 2015 is... Triple Mania 22 from AAA. Here's the part where we get to talk about AAA. Oh my god. You know, AAA is a AAA is a decent promotion and it sucks that we're talking about them in a capacity uh regarding something bad, but this cannot be ignored. Triple Mania 22, which by the way is the WrestleMania of AAA was bad. All right? Every <sighs> This, this was so bad, all right? It was so bad that Dave Meltzer gave his fourth ever minus five stars match rating to one of the matches in Triple Mania. Seriously? Seriously. Seriously. One of only four. It is in leagues with Hulk Hogan versus the Ultimate Warrior at WCW Halloween Havoc, okay? That wow. is bad. That is really, really bad. But the biggest reason why Triple Mania 22 wins is because unlike every other pay-per-view this year from any promotion, Triple Mania 22 didn't work. There were sound issues and video issues all over the place. There was problems with connections and with power, all right? When you buy something, you expect it to work. This pay-per-view didn't work on a visual or audio level, and that sucks. And from a promotional level, it didn't work because there were a bunch of people who were supposed to show up who didn't. Like Ricochet and Jeff Jarrett were both supposed to be there, but they both missed the event. It almost made it seem like nobody wanted to be a part of Triple Mania. This was no bueno. There's not much else we can say about it. Triple Mania 22, worst pay-per-view slash special event of 2015. Even though you guys may not have seen it, 
watch it if you're curious, but just a warning from me, you're not going to be satisfied at all. It is by far the worst pay-per-view. It, it's just bad in every way. Moving on to another good category, um, wrestling is driven by one thing primarily. It's not promos, it's not personalities, it's not star power, it's not even wrestling. Wrestling hinges on its storylines. When you take a character, or a group of characters, or even a full, uh, an entire federation over the course of months, years, and even decades, you can weave complicated and fantastic storylines and angles that just make you feel something that you could never feel from anything that isn't wrestling. Like Max Landis said, a lot of wrestling sucks, but when it's good, it's fucking great. So, here are your honorable mentions for best storyline slash angle of 2015. Johnny Mundo turns heel and betrays El Patron. Kevin Owens attempts to dethrone John Cena. Mil Muertes and Phoenix attempt to kill each other. Bray Wyatt's rivalry with Roman Reigns. And your winner for best storyline slash angle of 2015 is... Bailey wins the NXT Women's Championship. This is a story right here. See, WWE, this is how you do the underdog narrative and not suck at it. And you know what's funny about NXT? Just eight months prior, we got the rise of Sami Zayn. All right? Mm. A- NXT underdog stories are a no goddamn brainer. You see them once or even twice a year, and they are fantastic. Bailey winning that championship was such a monumental feeling for everybody. You saw her struggle. You knew what she was going for, but she could never do it. And then she does it. All right? It's when someone does the impossible. It's when it's, a, it's the best feeling in the world. All right? You, you know it's impossible. And you do it anyway. That is what makes a good storyline. When you have a character like Bailey, who's const- who's who has a gimmick that you don't really believe, like, oh, hey, I'm a hugger. Like, hey, that's cute. You're not champion material. Just move along. She plays off like a comedy character, but she can wrestle. She has the energy and the charisma. She gets the people excited. And I think WWE took notice of that. It's just like, okay, let's give her a chance. And she put on a hell of a match to do so. A match of the year candidate, if you will. But when it comes to Bailey winning the NXT title, it's that feel-good moment at the end that encapsulates her rise and how it goes on from there. Yeah, like, and and the way it kept building and building and the the absolute nattier of it, of the whole thing was when Emma beat her, who's basically seen as one of the lower card divas in nxt she's gotten and, a little better yeah well yeah but it, i i don't mean that as any disrespect to her because the women are built really strongly over there but she she loses to emma and has to take time off to heal an injury and then she comes back beats emma and then beats charlotte and then beats becky lynch and then beats sasha for the title and then beats Sasha again, and then beats Alexa Bliss for the title, and then Eva Marie, just one after another after another, proving herself at being worthy of the NXT Women's Championship. She like, competed in the first ever 30-minute Iron Women match. That, that is impressive. That was fucking great. And won, too. Mm-hmm. And, and on top of that, like, over time, like, we could have we could have easily put... Bailey in the running for best gimmick because over the course of the year her personality has been tweaked ever so slightly now she shows more aggression when she needs to like she is one of the best women working in the dub or in the world right now like she is legitimately great there is a reason why she's a part of the four horsewomen so Bailey winning the NXT women's championship easily the best storyline of 2015 but now we're going to go to the worst. Okay, I I want to say that this year has driven our patience up the wall. It has gotten us to the point where some of us were willing to quit. And you're saying, oh, but the storylines this year weren't that bad, right? <laughs> well, hmm, if they weren't that bad, we wouldn't have a category for it. So... Before I get into this, uh, one of our previous co-hosts, Acharki, would like to put his thoughts in on the worst storyline angle this year. 
What is up, folks? My name is Acharky, and to keep this brief, my pick for the stupidest storyline angle for 2015 had to have been the love split, what have you, between Lana and Rusev with Dolph Ziggler and Summer Rae, and the bullshit that went on in between. It was drawn out, it was boring, it was poorly planned and to top it all off had the cherry on the shit Sunday with Lana and Rusev automatically getting married which made no sense in the context of the characters fuck this company and now honorable mentions Bray Wyatt versus the Brothers of Destruction the in, the entire thing Zeb Coulter creates Mex America The Miz and Damian Sandow break up TNA's four month championship tournament and the winner of worst storyline angle. Okay, seriously, you guys should know by now. This one is a, this one's a no brainer. Rusev and Lana break up. This entire fucking feud is the worst storyline I have seen in a long, long time. It was bad enough when it was just some stupid love triangle, but then Little Miss Lana decided to make. Uh, a little, little, uh, little bomb go off on something called TMZ, and that completely destroyed the feud. And they're still trying to recover from it, and they're not doing a good job of recovering from that either. You're still seeing it. It's still fucking stupid. It was so bad it made me make a separate video just to talk about how bad it was. Yeah. This this just hindered the careers of everyone involved. It made everyone look like fucking chodes. Rusev Even went, Ziggler. Rusev went from being an unstoppable badass to cuddly. Like, that's that's not exactly a persona that you want your big, strong guy to take. Dolph Ziggler went from a guy that everybody wanted to cheer for to kind of a douchebag. That's that kind of was his thing from the start, you know, the whole show off thing. It only works when he's able to back it up in the right way. Otherwise, he's just a douche. Yeah, like you're you're right about that. But at the same time, he was a lovable douche in this feud. He was a douchey douche. Yeah, the believability of this is what makes this the worst feud possible nobody was believing this nobody gave a shit about this soap opera angle and then when it like it fell apart on tmz and the w tried to recover from it nobody believes this angle nobody gives a shit about this angle nobody wants to actually see this angle and the one that it hurt the most out of everyone was lana because she was looking so freaking impressive before this all happened she was she was on top of the world. She was like commanding this super strong dude and just and just basically unleashing him upon the world. And now she's what like a probably she's basically the worst a damsel. Diva. Yeah, no, the she is a damsel. Diva. Like R- Ryback finger pokes her and she goes ah. It's, I kind of don't want to see her wrestle. She went from a woman that was strong and powerful and confident and controlled the biggest beast in the roster to a damsel in distress. I, I can't believe that they would do something like that. Fucking, fucking Lana. Okay, Lana! They basically ruined the whole damn thing. They ruined Lana! God damn it, Lana was so perfect before and now she's... she's like, she showed up in that little vignette before TLC in what looked like a German, like one of those, one of those getups that the German ladies wear in Oktoberfest while they're carrying like 10 steins of beer. Yeah. Super strong lady right there. But let's no, move. Let's, move let's okay. Yeah. Let's move the fuck on, please. <laughs> Worst storyline ever. The Rusev and Lana breakup. So I know we were just talking about like the worst thing ever, but I want to bring us back again. I want to actually talk about something important. We have um, a little thing. Uh, Kaukos made a little thing that he'd like to show. But before we get into that, I just want to say that this year has been a physical and emotional roller coaster for wrestling fans all over the world. Whether it's battling injuries or sicknesses, we've seen some amazing and talented wrestlers pass away this year. The thing about those who passed, they left everything in the ring. Their souls are immortalized in the squared circle and will be remembered forever in the history books, in posters, and in our minds. It's worth saying that no one is truly dead until the ripples they cause in the world die away. So 
Here, we pay tribute to those we have lost in the year of 2015. Thank you very much to all of those on that list. Uh, unfortunately, we have to add you to it. Rest in peace, everybody. Thank you very much for giving us such wonderful spectacles and showcasing your amazing talents throughout the world. You will never be forgotten. And I have to follow that. Yes, you do, Nikki! Next category! Yeah, top that, bitch. <laughs> okay. Why do we watch wrestling? Well, I would say we watch for those big moments the ones that shock us like undertaker throwing mick foley off the cell or uh edge hitting a super spear on jeff hardy or randy orton hitting an rko on a shooting star pressing evan Bourne. just those big crazy shocker moments let's talk about the big ones from this year here are your honorable mentions for biggest shocker of 2015 the dudley boys return the wyatt family abducts the undertaker Seth Rollins cashes in Money in the Bank. Brock Lesnar and The Undertaker Blade. And your winner of Biggest Shocker of the Year, the huge amount of injuries that have just destroyed the entire roster. Yeah, specifically starting off with Daniel Bryan. Like, he was supposed to make the Intercontinental Championship really mean something. And... Whoops, that didn't even last a month. So I want to go through a, a small list just off the top of my head of all of the wrestlers throughout the year of 2015, just specifically in WWE, mind you, that are now off the table or have been off the table for a significant amount of time. You have uh, Jimmy Uso, Daniel Bryan, Cesaro, Sting, Randy Orton, Stardust, uh, Bad News Barrett or King Barrett or whoever the fuck. You have Seth Rollins now, Sami Zayn. You have Hideo Itami. All right, that's just off the top of my of my head. There's probably more than I'm missing. Can you guys Gold remember? Dust. Huh? Well, Goldust is back. Probably yeah, but he the, did miss time. Yeah, he did. He missed a lot of the year because of an injury. And uh, Bo, Bo Dallas as well missed a significant part of uh, 2015. The buildup to, to WrestleMania. He missed but all of that. The biggest one, though, that ended up shocking us the most was Seth Rollins. When Seth Rollins was forced to vacate the title, it changed 
everything. It completely changed Survivor Series and has changed things from then on. There were WrestleMania plans put in store for Mr. Rollins. He was more than likely going to carry it to WrestleMania and onwards. He probably was going to make a record with it. But because that happened and adding up to the fact that around that time, Cena was gone, Orton was gone, all the big stars were going, Cesaro was gone, so... They really had to change things up, and I think we've made a made a point in the show that the WWE has not done a very good job of building up the mid card. We've 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 talked about that in the last one, where the WWE has not do a very good job of building up their own roster, and there's only so like an X amount of stars that they actually have, and when the big ones are injured, well, panic time. It is just it's crippling the roster, and like it, it's baffling to think about because we're living in a day and age where like concussion awareness is at an all-time high and like medical advancements are just crazy at this point so you would think that wrestling would be safer at this point like you would see like not as many injuries while still putting on an entertaining product but just This year has been an absolute nightmare in terms of all of these great wrestlers just up and falling off the face of the earth. With Seth Rollins and Daniel Bryan specifically, these were two big ones that came out of nowhere and really forced things to, like, change. And then let's just say that in light of certain events, we finally got Roman Reigns to be the champion. I guess that's temporary for right now till till crossfit jesus or john cena come back to save us so john cena is on the promotional poster for royal rumble hey cena wins the royal rumble and then takes the title off roman reigns and cena wins lol you know it's funny i'm (laughs) kind of okay with that (laughs) who's gonna be number 30 it's john cena (laughs) massive amount of injuries that have plagued the wwe roster absolutely wins biggest shocker not only was it just one shocker it was a series of them one right after the other especially in the later part of 2015 no question that it wins yeah stardust we just found out recently stardust is now apparently injured well great now what are they gonna do Uh, at least stardust is the kind of guy where if the wwe were smart they would still put him in promos oh they're, they're doing that right now with him and titus i have no idea what they're trying to do there i think something like Another Booker T or Goldust situation, but regardless. You know what? I, I'm cool with that because Booker, T- Booker T and Goldust were great. Go back All and watch right. some of their stuff. Watch the video where Booker T doesn't quite <laughs> understand what a lumberjack match is. <laughs> Booker T and Goldust. Booker T and Goldust. Okay, next category. Let's move on. So uh, we just got done with Biggest Shockers, but a lot of that happens within kayfabe. Or, or it, it just happens because it happens, and while it's detrimental to the product, uh, it, it's not a big thing that can really ruin lives. Well, we're going to go to the biggest scandal category. These are the things that happen throughout the year that just really just ruin shit for people. The fans, the people involved, it's just things and and stuff that can really affect things down the line. You, there are no quick fixes for anything on this list. Here are the honorable mentions for biggest scandal of 2015. Lana and Rusev get engaged, are punished for it. Bill DeMott is fired under allegations of abuse. Zara Schreiber revealed to be a Nazi sympathizer. Paige brings up Flair family death live on air. Seth Rollins' nude photos are leaked. And your winner for Biggest Scandal 2015 is... Hogan's racist rant exposed by Gawker. Oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. This was a huge mess when this happened. This this scandal probably has the biggest effect out of all of these. Has there ever been a lawsuit where both parties lost? Can that happen here? Like, wait, did this, wait, did that happen? Uh, no, no. I'm just saying I want both of these companies to, or not both of these entities to die, like not in real life, but like financially. Just <sighs> yeah. Fuck well, Hogan, both. Hogan's already dying financially. That's why he wrestled for TNA because his wife took everything from him. But hmm, really, uh, I did not know that. Yes, because Hogan cheated. Yeah, yeah, that happened back in 2012, but Hogan that's neither here Hogan. nor there. Right now, we have to focus on what happened this year, and what happened this year 
Okay, this is huge because not only does this put another notch on the on the belt of Gawker just being total fucking scumbag pieces of shit, but it also prompted WWE to give Hogan the Chris Benoit treatment. Yeah. What the fuck, Hogan? Hogan, the face of WWE, the guy that made WWE into a household name, and he's gone. They fired him. They got rid of his Legends contract. I think he's gone from the Hall of Fame. Uh, what the okay, fuck? Okay, wait, you mean to fucking tell me, in terms of racist shit, you mean to tell me that Hulk Hogan is out of the Hall of Fame, but Donald fucking Trump is still in there? Give me a fucking break. I don't, I don't know, man. It was all reactionary, but the fact that it happened just really exacerbates all this that much. Nobody, nobody wins in this situation. Gawker doesn't win, thank God. Hogan doesn't win, thank God. WWE doesn't win, eh, okay. (laughs) But I cannot fucking believe that this happened. It was such a shockwave that that's that's gonna be felt forever because Hogan's never gonna be mentioned on WWE programming ever again. At least for, for quite some fucking time. Here's the thing. I I remember one point where they were bringing up something that would involve Hulk Hogan, but they instead replaced his name with the Immortal One. I didn't even know that was Hulk's nickname. I'm Uh, not even sure if it is. Yeah, Immortal Hulk Hogan, Hulkamania. Yeah, that makes sense. But the thing about this, though, is that all of these, all the honorable mentions are pretty bad. Like, I'll say this Nazi sympathizer one I thought was the worst, but this <laughs> one, you are actually erased from history. They took, like, a freaking Sharpie marker and erased your name. That is huge, especially for Hulk Hogan, who many fans don't even know him now, and many fans probably will never get to know him now. And that's a damn shame, because in terms of history, you can't just fucking erase Hulk Hogan. Hulk Hogan didn't do what Benoit did, so there should be at least a little bit of leeway there. But goddamn, you heard mm. him actually say these things on audio. That As... You can't say, oh, that wasn't me. That was fucking Hulk Hogan dropping the N-word. Here's the thing, like... We're living in a new era where you really, really cannot be racist. And you gotta be PC, bro, or some shit like that. If the WWE wanted to make a big statement to prove that, yeah, we're really trying hard not to be racist because the WWE is kind of known for being really fucking racist. Oh, gee. Uh, ask Shelton or ask the other Shelton. But Yeah. Like... If they wanted to make a big statement to, to to tell people that they are serious about cleaning up their act in this regard, they did it. They made a pretty big statement. They they killed Hulkamania. Yeah, which they they fucking yeah. killed Hulkamania. I I this whole this whole thing is just unbelievably ridiculous, and it boggles my mind we we live in a climate where racial sensitivity is at an all-time high the good kind and the bad kind and it it definitely caused wwe to have to take emergency steps and go into panic mode to make sure that like like nikki said that they were serious about this so the biggest scandal of 2015 goes to hogan and gawker fuck both those guys yeah seriously fuck them forever Continuing onwards with some of the really bad stuff that happens. So earlier I talked about best gimmicks and how gimmicks are important. That's all fine and well. But what if you have a gimmick where it just makes you go, ugh. These gimmicks are the ones that we don't give a shit about, that we kind of make fun of, that we wish WWE could look at and say, okay, we fucked up. Let's take them back to the drawing board. These are nominees or honorable mentions. What what the fuck ever? They're, They're the same thing at this point for worst gimmick. Adam Rose, Party Pooper. Damian Sandow, Curtis Axel, The Meta Powers. The Ascension, Legion of Doom 2.0. Roman Reigns, Hardened Badass. And the winner of, well, this is not really a winner per se, the winner of Worst Gimmick goes to Solomon Crow, Leet Haxor. It's pretty bad when a gimmick is so bad that you quit the company in order to save your image. Yeah, this this one, eh, this one's a doozy. Like, and the weird part is, I'm not really sure how this went so wrong. Like, 
they 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 kept they kept doing the pr- the vignettes for his pr- for his debut. Solomon came out, did his thing. Like, yeah, his original finisher was shy, but at least his second finisher that he came up with was really cool. Yeah. But but like they didn't do anything with him. Like he didn't do any w- things that would incorporate the hacking or hacking gimmick. Like he was just a guy. That right there is the biggest shame. This gimmick had so much going for it. Like, could you imagine if Solomon Crow, with a person uh, that he has a rivalry with, every time he comes out, uh, the lights go wrong, or it plays a really stupid song, or 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 maybe the ring gets dismantled at random points in his match, or uh, Solomon Crow, they got a lot of things that they could have done with the hacker gimmick just to fuck everything up and make it interesting. The the list of ideas that you go on with this just goes for miles long and can easily satiate the gimmick for years but they were they were either too afraid or they wanted to keep it clean not clean as in pg clean i mean clean as in like everything has to be in perfect working order all the time but Mm -hmm. that that's dumb okay you have commentators they can explain shit not to mention the audience isn't dumb they know it's solomon crow they're gonna know it's solomon crow so i don't understand why they didn't take this further because the possibilities for a gimmick like this were endless but they did nothing with it and as such solomon crow was asked to be relieved of his contract with NXT. It was granted, and now he's gone. That sucks. Like, the only thing that I can think of that could have caused this was that it was, maybe it wasn't, like, testing well in NXT shows. Like, maybe they tried to do some stuff, and the fans just weren't buying it. That's the only thing I can think of to explain how this could have flopped so hard. Other than that, like, this is just the biggest, like... The biggest waste of potential that this company has had in a while. Like, this could have been something really cool. Solomon Crow, lead Haxer, gets worst gimmick of 2015. All right. So, every so often you get this one moment that just puts your jaw and drops it to the floor and makes you go, holy shit. Before we get into our nominees for Spot of the Year... Voice of Reason, what do you think spot of the year was? This wasn't a tough decision. By far, the best spot of 2015 in WWE was Kalista performing the Salida del Sol on Jey Uso onto a stationary ladder at TLC. Any high-risk maneuver requires you to make sure the maneuver looks like it hurts, but it also has the biggest chance of screwing up. The Salida del Sol onto the ladder was the undisputed champion in terms of everything could go wrong if I fuck up this move. As a result, the maneuver landed perfectly, preventing serious injury to Jey Uso's neck and Kalisto's back. And it still looked like it hurt. That's why my pick for best spot of 2015 goes to Salida Del Sol onto the ladder. And now, here are your honorable mentions for spot of the year. Brock Lesnar and The Undertaker destroy the ring at Hell in a Cell. Luke Harper powerbombs Dean Ambrose through a ladder at WrestleMania 31. Randy Orton turns a curb stomp into an RKO at WrestleMania 31. Angelico's 20-foot crossbody in Ultima Lucha. Cage puts the Mac through a cinder block, Ultima Lucha. And your winner of Spot of the Year was Kalisto Selena Del Sol off of a ladder at TLC. Holy shit. Just a side note before before we talk about this, just a side note. Um I started putting together this list before TLC and the original winner was uh Angelico's crossbody because obvious. But after TLC, I immediately changed it to the Salida del Sol because you are insane if you think anything else is bigger. Okay, look, with all of the other categories, you're going to have people that uh, agree with it and you're going to have people that disagree with it for all reasons, most of most, if not all of which are going to be completely valid. But not this one. No, this is the only winner. Come the fuck on, man. This (laughs) is a death defying move. That is the one word that nicely sums all this up, because with with Angelico's move, he got a great running start. He would have made it this move. 
This move that Kalisto did had had which one was it, Jimmy or Jay? Whatever. Had Jimmy. one of the Usos. Okay, had Jimmy's foot slipped or had anything gone wrong with that, they both would have gone crashing down to the ground, and Kalisto would have more than likely come out with a neck injury from that. But the way that that move was done was beautiful and scary at the same time. I remember I remember watching this. And I saw what Kalisto was going to do. I'm like, no, 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 no. Don't do this. No, that is a bad idea. Oh, okay, holy shit. Yeah, go everybody else. Holy shit. This move was amazing how they managed to pull it off it's one of the dangerous moves you'll ever see in a tlc match i put this right up there with the freaking jeff hardy spear from wrestlemania 17 I, I put that up there Christ. i put this up there with all of the classic ladder spots the Shawn michaels and razor ramon spots i put this up there with everything chris jericho had ever done i put this up with the tower of doom that was done at the motb match at wrestlemania 24 i put this up there with all of the classic ladder spots this it, the Salida del Sol off the ladder is immortalized on that list. No fucking question. No and question that it belongs. It's the biggest factor in the fact that Kalisto needs a big time singles push sooner yes. rather than later. Because immediately after the Selena del Sol, Sin Cara got up on the top rope and decided that it would be a wonderful idea to do a little senton and he landed directly on his head. Sin Cara, uh, the master of Botchamania. Keck. Kalisto has so much freaking potential, and they've already started doing glimpses of that with him actually progressing forward in the world title tournament. So I think if the if the crowd can get behind Kalisto, then a singles push may be the best, because if the Lucha Dragons aren't going to win the tag titles, fuck it, split them up, let Kalisto run wild. Yeah, like, I, I was talking about who Sheamus should face like this, this was back when Sheamus was still champion. Who Sheamus should face at the Royal Rumble for the title? And I brought up Kalisto, and I was only half joking. Like, if they wanted to really, like, they need to make some new stars right now. And if they wanted to be serious about making this guy the next Rey Mysterio, do they it. They could do it right now. They could either have him face Sheamus and lose for the world title, or have him face Alberto for the United States title and win. Although I kind of don't want to see that match because they already competed once and it was balls. Yeah. If we have, didn't have him beat Dean Ambrose. Have him beat Dean Ambrose, maybe. Okay. I could see that. I would be okay with that, with that outcome. Absolutely. More title changes are, are definitely not a bad thing as long as it's not hot potato. All right. I don't mind short reigns at all. It definitely allows people to reposition themselves. But after that Salida del Sol, Kalisto went from went from dude to star. That Salida del Sol. And, and of course, I can't ignore fucking U uh, Jimmy Uso. All right. that The fact that he was agreed to do that was... He could have fucking died. I was can't it? believe... Wasn't he the Uso that's been injured for most of the year? It may have been Jay. I need... Okay, I need to take a look because um, left is Jay, right is uh, Jimmy when it comes to the face paint. And I don't remember yeah, which way, side it was on. The way you can tell is Jay Leno left The Tonight Show and Jimmy Fallon stepped right in. That's fucking awesome! Holy <laughs> shit! I need to remember that! But yes, okay... This spot is definitely not just one of the best of the year, but the best of the of the current decade. No question. Kalisto Salida del Sol off the ladder is spot of the year 2015. They're going to make so much money off of Kalisto. It's they are. The freaking mask and shit. Go for it. Absolutely. All, All right. right. So moving on, we're going to get to the really big categories, the ones that you guys are going to be contesting in the comments section, which I actually kind of hope you do. I like reading your dialogue, even though I don't always respond to it. I am reading those comments. So please we love you guys. We love all the comments you give us. Yes, Make please more. put put your bullshit in the comments and I will wade through all of it. Because I love all of you. So, <laughs> the first big category that's going to be very uh, contended in the comments, maybe, probably. Well, this is match of the year, man. All right. There's so many amazing matches that happened this year. You, you, I mean, people will say that 2015 was a crap year, but every year, even if it's a crappy year, you're going to get match after match after match of absolute brilliance. And our honorable mentions this year for match of the year 
is just a small handful of the excellence that we were given this year. So without further ado, honorable mentions for match of the year. Brock Lesnar versus Roman Reigns at WrestleMania 31. John Cena versus Cesaro on Monday Night Raw. Kevin Owens versus John Cena at Money in the Bank. Shinsuke Nakamura versus Kota Ibushi at Wrestle Kingdom 9. Bailey versus Sasha Banks, NXT Takeover, Respect. The New Day versus the Usos versus the Lucha Dragons, TLC. Son of Havoc and Helico and Ivelisse versus The Crew, Lucha Underground, their first match. Brock Lesnar versus The Undertaker at Hell in a Cell. Roman Reigns, Dean Ambrose, Randy Orton, and Seth Rollins in a fatal four-way at Payback. Seth Rollins versus John Cena at SummerSlam. And... Bailey versus Sasha Banks at NXT TakeOver Brooklyn. Oh, yeah, snap. I put that last on the honorable mentions for a reason. It was very big in contention for our current winner. We w- didn't know what to go for because NXT TakeOver Brooklyn, the Bailey versus Sasha Banks match, it is easily the best match of the year story-wise. But in our opinions, it was not the best match of the year wrestling-wise. But we decided to go with best wrestling match instead of story this time. So your winner for match of the year 2015 is John Cena versus Seth Rollins versus Brock Lesnar at Royal Rumble. Man, the Royal Rumble was a shit show this year, but there was one good thing about it. We got match of the year. And, and the thing is, I think we said in the Royal Rumble wrap-up video that this was going to be match of the year there. Like, somebody go back in the footage and see if we actually did say this, but I am next to certain one of us said... You Cena did Rollins actually. Lester. You said it was an early contender. I, I might have said that. No, you did. I remember you did. You said it was an early contender for match of the year, and guess what? We decided to pick it. We decided to pick it because as far as wrestling goes, uh, uh, just just wrestling specifically, uh, when it comes to story, uh, Sasha Banks versus Bayley absolutely wins hands down, but we decided, because everybody's going to be saying that that match was match of the year, we decided to be a little bit dif- uh, different and chose this match as match of the year because as far as pure wrestling goes, nothing else comes close here. You have Cena doing unique move after unique move. You have Brock Lesnar selling like a boss, and he's just throwing everybody around the ring, and then you have Seth Rollins doing the Shane O'Mac announce table leap. You had him doing a Phoenix splash that he actually fucking landed. All right, you have... I think this was the one time that John Cena actually hit the springboard stunner. Yeah. No, no, actually, the springboard stunner started at WrestleMania, so he he didn't Uh, invent it yet. So, no, it wasn't in the match. But not a single solitary second of this match is is not exciting, especially since you have Brock Lesnar in it. And Brock Lesnar is very good at starting a match at a quick pace because he immediately just rushes at the at the dude and beats him down. So Brock Lesnar matches have that advantage. There's no uh, submission holds. There's no chain wrestling at the very beginning. You just have Brock Lesnar colliding with whomever his opponent is and getting the upper hand immediately, which, well, makes sense for an MMA fighter. Works in kayfabe, and it works here. And then John Cena and Seth Rollins have to fight their way up because they're facing this indomitable beast. And then you have John Cena and Seth Rollins and Brock Lesnar trading places within the ring to make sure everybody gets ample ring time to showcase their stuff. And it just builds and builds and builds and goes on with Brock Lesnar winning the title, or not winning the title, but retaining the title. It it was fantastic. It's probably the best triple threat I've ever seen. And I've seen a lot of triple threats, okay? I've seen quite a bit of them, but this one was the best. I wouldn't say it's the best, but this match does one great thing, and it really helps things throughout the rest of the year for Seth Rollins. This match was a main event match for him, for him to strut his stuff, and it made him look less like a doofus, because before then, he's like, oh, look, I'm going to get away, and I'm going to pull all this cheap shit. No, here... He showed that he was able to hang with the main event. He was able to show that he is a star here. He had all the abilities and all the the moments to pull that off. And he did fucking amazing in doing so. And you've got three, like, 
three individual styles with all three of these guys. You got the high flyer in Rollins, you've got the brawler in Lesnar, and you've got Cena doing Cena moves. Like the, the balanced all around sort of thing. Yeah, like every single one of these guys brought something unique to the table and the, the sum was or the sum total was greater than the individual parts like these guys tore the Royal Rumble apart and in a pay-per-view that was absolute dog shite. Otherwise, Cena Rollins Lesnar was unbelievably great. The one the one piece of gold in a pile of crap. Absolutely. John Cena, Seth Rollins, Brock Lesnar, triple threat at Royal Rumble wins match of the year for 2015. So now we come to the big one. The granddaddy of all friggin' wrestling award shows, Wrestler of the Year. In order to get this, you have to have done a lot this year. You have to have had not just one moment, but a several moments. You've had to have had maybe a championship reign. You may, you've had to have something interesting. You've had to have a consistent flow throughout the year. You've had to have something good, something believable, something interesting. All these great things come together to make the wrestler of this year. So let's get to the honorable mentions. We got a lot to go through here. Cesaro. Kevin Owens, Bailey, Brock Lesnar, Johnny Mundo, Sasha Banks, Roman Reigns. Oh, my God, I can already hear the comments. Boo. Jervis Cottonbelly, Dean Ambrose, John Cena, Princess Kimberly, Shinsuke Nakamura, Big E, Chuck Taylor, Anne Helico, and Jay Lethal. Our winner of Wrestler of the Year 2015 is Seth Motherfucking Rollins. This one was close. Like I, I really thought that it should have been John Cena, but you guys kind of convinced me on Seth Rollins because. Cena has done a lot this year that has really kind of changed how people see him. And you could easily make the case for Cena. But, but, Rollins had one of the biggest moments of the year with the WrestleMania cash-in. One of the biggest spots of the year with the curb stomp into the RKO. And several great uh, title defenses like the one at SummerSlam against Cena or the one at uh, Money in the Bank against Ambrose or the one at Payback uh, in the Fatal 4-Way. Seth Rollins has made this year his own by starting off with the Royal Rumble, working his way up to cashing in at WrestleMania in the, one of the biggest moments of his entire fucking career and then moving onwards to where people were thinking, oh, so he's just going to lose the title to somebody else. But his entire title reign, all uh, six, seven months of it, I think, give or take, have been impressive. He has marked up accolades along the way. Never, not, not in a long time have we looked at a championship reign that has been eventful and interesting, one that you can actually talk about and remember. This guy, when, when he was WWE champion, managed to unify that and the United States Championship in one hell of a SummerSlam moment. Granted, the, the whole effect was nullified later, but it was still a very important historic moment for that to happen. He made history along the way. He had one hell of a reign, and though he's not going to be competing probably after WrestleMania or Lord knows when he's going to come back, but what he left as an impact as WWE Champion makes him Wrestler of the Year for improving, for providing amazing content, for being a fucking awesome wrestler, for being able to become a believable champion and a star with the title. This is something that Roman Reigns couldn't possibly get. Seth Rollins got over organically. He got over on his own. Granted, the authority kind of pushed him into a heel. They pushed him the best way that heel could, but people got behind him because he was that damn good. And he didn't need to be shoved down everyone's throats in order for that to happen. I have nothing else to say, honestly. Toon, I, I, Nikki, I think Toon summarized our thoughts pretty fucking well. Seth Rollins, he is the best. He is CrossFit Jesus for a reason. 
<laughs> he came he up with CrossFit, that. CrossFit. Came up with that. It's because of his hair and the fact that he pushes CrossFit a lot. Ah, uh, okay. Makes total sense. CrossFit Jesus broke his knee for our sins. <laughs> and he will come back, and he will come back as the best fucking face ever. Oh, Crazy God, that face pop. Oh, my God. Weirdly enough, CrossFit Jesus will probably come back sometime around Easter. Hey! <laughs> Your winner for Best Wrestler 2015, Seth Rollins. And probably Best Gimmick of 2016, Resurrected Deity. <laughs> Give him an excuse to wear the white all the time. I don't know. Uh, I dig it. <sighs> so this has been one hell of an award thingy, uh, award thingy best worst thing that we've done. This has been a long one, too. But it brings us some closure for 2015. And now we move onwards to the road to WrestleMania 32, where we start all over again. Lord knows what the hell is going to happen this time, but we can all hope that it'll be for the best. And if this year's WrestleMania fucking blows, hell, if this Royal Rumble blows, you're going to be off to another rocky start, ladies and germs. All I know is that this year needs significantly more Damian Sandow than the last one. Put down in the comments what you think of most of these uh, best and worst of. Please put your thoughts you want to hear. Like, comment, subscribe. Patreon, Twitter. All, you can follow all of us on Twitter. All that good stuff. Now we can say a proper goodbye. See you folks later.